Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to webinar number four of our cybersecurity series. My name is John Keegan. I'm a business advisor with the Department of Industry, Innovation and Sciences Entrepreneurs Program, which is bringing this cybersecurity series to you. The Entrepreneurs Program is a, uh, a, a federal government program that assists small to medium enterprises in growing their business. I'm part of a cohort of some hundred business advisors and facilitators across the country who deliver no-cost business evaluations of, of your businesses and set you up for a grant. We have a, a series of grants that are very attractive uh, and range from a $20,000 business growth grant, which is provided on a dollar for dollar basis, once you've had a business evaluation, to a $50,000 research grant, which is also provided on a dollar to dollar basis, and helps to bridge the gap between industry and university. So you can get a university qualified uh, uh, academic to work on your business and solve a, an intractable problem or develop a new product. And finally, we have the Accelerating Commercialisation Program, which is highly competitive, but it, it, it offers assistance for a new idea, a new idea that could go global, a new idea that's got serious growth and uh, competitive advantages, and uh, the grants there range right up to a million dollars on a dollar for dollar basis. So, here we are at uh, webinar number four, and webinar number four is uh, to do with uh, uh, threats. Uh, it's to be delivered by Hivint, which I'm reliably informed is one of the fastest growing cybersecurity uh, businesses in Australia and in fact beyond because it is cybersecurity. So we are having uh, Nick and Aaron from Hivint deliver this uh, webinar and uh, I'm about to finish but before we join with Nick and Aaron we will be showing you a short video. Thank you. Welcome. This is the fourth webinar covering cybersecurity for small and medium businesses. These webinars are brought to you by Australian cybersecurity consulting firm Hyvent as part of the Australian Government's Business Entrepreneurs Program. Today's webinar will focus on helping your business understand the importance of having a solid plan in place for how to respond to a cybersecurity incident. Because sometimes, despite every effort you might make, it's still possible for your business to suffer a breach of some kind. And the steps you take following a breach can make all the difference in minimising the damage you suffer and casting your business in a positive light to your industry peers and the community at large. As a quick reminder, here's what we covered in our first three webinars. In webinar one, we introduced the concept of cybersecurity as an ongoing journey for your business. A journey that really continues for as long as your business operates. No matter where you are on the journey today, whether starting out, at the intermediate stage, or highly advanced, there are always steps you can take to improve your overall approach to security. And this is essential, because cyber threats and attack methods are constantly evolving, and so your business's approach to security needs to as well. In Webinar 2, we spoke about the various types of cyber threats your small or medium business is likely to face, including malicious email scams, ransomware, hacking and device compromise attempts, and denial of service attacks. We also spoke about the specific steps you can take to most effectively reduce your business's chances of falling prey to each type of threat. We also discussed the different actors who might instigate cyber attacks against your business, whether financially motivated cyber criminals, cyber espionage groups, malicious insiders, or otherwise. In Webinar 3, we drilled down into more detail about the specific cybersecurity steps you can take at various stages on the security journey to most effectively secure your organization, including what you can do if you're looking to become a real industry leader when it comes to security. This covered steps as varied as regular patching of systems and software, using security software, managing your user accounts carefully, and looking at acquiring cyber insurance. Webinar 3 was very practically focused, so if you get the chance, we strongly recommend you watch it again. You can do so at industry.ozgovtv.com. You can also access cheat sheets summarising the core content that we covered in the first three webinars on the security colony, Hyvin's purpose-built cybersecurity collaboration platform at portal.securitycolony.com. Remember, 
Signing up is free and you can also get answers to any cybersecurity related questions your business is facing from Hyvent's expert advisors. You'll also be able to access a range of resources to support you on your cybersecurity journey. And with that, it's time to kick off webinar four. It's a pleasure to have you with us and we hope you find it enjoyable. Thanks, John, for that introduction, and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, as was mentioned, this is the fourth uh, of the webinars in the cybersecurity series. Uh, for those who've joined us for the earlier webinars, um, the first was really a, an overall view of, of cybersecurity and how it affects small to medium enterprises. Uh, the second specifically looked at some of the threats that small to medium enterprises face, uh, and the third and most recent uh, looked at some of the operational basics around cybersecurity and some of the things that organizations need to concentrate on. In this webinar today, we're going to be looking at developing an incident response capability. And there are a couple of aspects to this. Partly it's preparing prior to an incident um, to make sure that you're ready when an incident occurs. And of course, we'll also talk about when an actual incident happens, some of the things that you need to keep in mind and how that response should play out. Now, if you did miss any of the earlier webinars, um, or if you do want to go back and check what, what was covered, um, you can view them all at industry.ozgovtv.com. Uh, and of course, I know we always talk every week uh, about the Security Colony platform. Um, so please, you are welcome to register at portal.securitycolony.com. Um, you can set up a free account, and on that site, we'll have the slides available, uh, a cheat sheet that captures the key material for the webinar, um, and also there's some additional material that will help you put in place an incident response plan. Um, so please do sign up. It's free. Um, you're welcome to ask us questions. And of course, through this webinar today as well, uh, I think in the bottom left-hand side of your screen, you'll be able to enter questions in, uh, and then we'll answer those at the end of the session. <coughs> so getting started, in today's webinar, as I mentioned at the start, we'll actually be talking about two different key parts of incident response. The first part is preparing for an incident and having the systems and processes in place and the technologies in place as well so that when an incident occurs, you can respond confidently. The second part is that really recognizing that while you can prepare as much as you like, incidents at some level are unavoidable. Um, it really is necessary for almost every organization to assume that at some point in the organization's life cycle, there will be a security incident. And it's for that reason that while it's important to prepare, while it's important to put mechanisms in place to try and stop incidents from occurring, it's also really important to try and detect them as effectively as possible and respond as efficiently as possible as well. Now, when we're talking about the likelihood of an incident, one of the things we spoke about in the first webinar was, was why a small to medium enterprise might be targeted. And it's important to touch on this because we'll talk as we go through this process about how this flows through to determining whether or not an incident has occurred. And one of the key things is really understanding what information you have that is sensitive and who may actually be trying to compromise the organization. Now in terms of why a small to medium enterprise might be targeted, one of the main reasons is that from an attacker's perspective, it's often seen that SMEs are likely to be an easier target. Um, the reality is that the security budget a small to medium enterprise can apply is significantly lower than that of a larger organization. Secondly, the data that's held by small to medium enterprises is often just as sensitive as that held by larger companies. Um, now there may be less of it. You may have a thousand customer records rather than 10,000 or 100,000, but the sensitivity is likely just the same. And the third part is that for many small to medium businesses, they can actually be seen as a key attack path to getting to larger businesses. And some of the major breaches that we've seen around the world have had exactly this dynamic. Um, you may have read stories in the paper about Netflix being uh, blackmailed by a hacker who had stolen Orange is the New Black, the latest series. Um, that largely was attributed to the compromise of a production company further down the chain. Similarly, you may have read about a breach of Target that happened a number of years ago where they lost a significant number in terms of hundreds of millions of credit card numbers. Uh, and again, that was a breach of a heating and ventilation maintenance company that itself was a, a medium-sized business. 
And so small to medium businesses can be a path for attacking larger organizations. So ultimately, having a good process is important for a couple of reasons. One is, if we accept that an incident is likely to occur at some point, having the process in place will allow you to minimize the loss. It will allow you to minimize the impact um, and to prevent the impact from getting out of control. And the other part, which is really worth keeping in mind, is having an effective incident response process can actually make your organization look better in the eyes of customers. Um, now, obviously, we're not suggesting that having an incident is a good thing. But if you look at the experience of organizations who've had things like a product recall event or a product safety event or something like that, and have responded effectively and genuinely demonstrated compassion, empathy for customers, and have really responded well, often they can come out of that process with a stronger brand and a stronger amount of trust from their customers than they had beforehand. So having an effective incident response process really can be important from the positioning of the business's perspective. And, and just carrying on from that point that Nick's mentioned, uh, there's also an increased amount of regulatory scrutiny that's really being applied. And this is really a trend we're seeing across the globe. When it comes to the cybersecurity practices of businesses of all sizes, but also specifically the incident response processes businesses have in place when it comes to actually dealing with the security breach. And so that's something that's important to appreciate for a variety of reasons, and we'll discuss those in the context uh, of Australia a little bit later on in this webinar. But we've mentioned on this slide here a case called Winham Worldwide and the US Federal Trade Commission. Now, the Federal Trade Commission is the equivalent regulator in the United States, so I guess you could say the ACCC in Australia. And they have powers under their, under their requisite legislation. I think that's Section 5 of the FTC Act. allows them to prosecute unfair or deceptive acts affecting commerce. Now, they've used this power quite a bit in recent times to take action against organizations who they feel have fallen short of the mark when it comes to meeting reasonable standards in relation to cybersecurity, particularly where there's a security breach and there's harm to the community that results. Now, in this case, Wynnum Worldwide experience is, is actually one of the largest hotel chains in the world. And from 2008 to 2009, their networks were breached by cyber attackers over a series of three different breaches. And as a result of this, cyber attackers were actually able to obtain 619,000 payment card details of different customers. Now, just on the next slide, there's actually more information about this case. But what, uh, what actually occurred here was that Wynnum Worldwide was actually found, thanks Nick, was actually found to have failed to employ reasonable security measures by the Federal Trade Commission. Now, for a variety of reasons, the Federal Trade Commission actually decided to take action against Wynnum Worldwide, but from an incident response perspective, they actually found, or they, they actually alleged that Wynnum Worldwide failed to have appropriate technical measures in place to be able to detect unauthorized access attempts into its network, and also didn't have appropriate incident response processes in place to then detect those unauthorized connection attempts. And so it was ultimately found that Wynnum Worldwide, from the FTC's point of view, hadn't really met the mark when it came to their incident response practices. And they had a regulatory order imposed upon them to implement a comprehensive cybersecurity program, uh, which will be subject to regulatory oversight over the next several years. So it's just an interesting case to, to profess this discussion in terms of highlighting the importance of, of, uh, of incident response processes and implementing an effective incident response process from a regulatory standpoint as well. And we'll keep talking about that later on in this webinar. But it is also likely to be particularly relevant in an Australian context with the introduction of the mandatory data breach notification laws, which no doubt many, many of the businesses watching this webinar will be interested in. And we will discuss those in a little bit more detail later on in the webinar. Um, at a high level, uh, the mandatory data breach notification laws in the Privacy Act, uh, they'll commence operation in uh, early 2018. Uh, they'll apply to businesses with a, uh, with a turnover of revenue greater than $3 million annually. And they'll also, sorry, and that's also the case for the Australian privacy principles. And I've mentioned that here on this slide because it's also important to note that even in the current setup with the, the privacy regime um, in, the, in the Privacy Act, the Australian privacy principles include aspects which can affect your cybersecurity practices and, and the way you uh, implement your cybersecurity practices and your incident response processes. Australian Privacy Principle 11 in particular is relevant. It requires organisations who hold personal information to take reasonable steps to secure that information from misuse, interference or loss, or an authorised access modification or disclosure. So just going and, and, and carrying on from the point Nick mentioned earlier on, the steps you take in the immediate aftermath of a security breach can, if you, if you 
implement an effective incident response process can greatly limit um, the potential uh, jeopardy that personal information you hold is placed in. So very important to be cognizant of that uh, and the importance of incident response in terms of placing you on the right side of, of the increasing amounts of regulatory requirements that are being imposed upon businesses. In terms of what an actual security incident is, well, we've already talked about the different types of cybersecurity threats that exist, and we specifically focused on that in webinar two. And really, the types of, uh, of, of incidents you can experience are just as broad. Now, you recall, uh, for example, that can include things like infection from malicious software, such as ransomware that encrypts your key business data, or malware. It can also include hacking and device compromise. Uh, whether that's from an external cyber attacker or even a malicious insider, both of those can constitute a potential security incident. And finally, denial of service attacks. We've also spoken about those in previous webinars. Denial of service attacks are effectively situations where cyber attackers flood your internet facing infrastructure with illegitimate traffic so that legitimate users, whether you're supply chain partners or customers, are no longer able to access that information. And I think something that's worth highlighting there, <clears throat> when we talk about um, the notifiable data breach uh, regime uh, and the aspects of the Privacy Act. Obviously, that just relates to personal information. So that just relates to um, the information of individuals um, that, that you may hold. A lot of these attacks, so things like malware infections, denial of service attacks, even in some cases if you get hacked, they may not actually be targeting personal information. They may be targeting confidential information. They may be targeting design specs. They may be targeting IP. A denial of service attack may simply be trying to cause an impact to the organization by knocking it offline. So the, the Privacy Act issue and the data breach issue is something that we'll talk about quite a bit because it's very topical, but it's also important when putting in place the incident response plan that it's not just around data breaches, that it does actually handle um, security incidents that don't have personal data involved. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. Oftentimes the terminology in this space tends to get a little bit conflated. Mm. So we're really looking at the broader concept of a security breach, and as part of that we'll also look as, at data breaches involving personal information, which is really a subset of that broader um umbrella term of, of security breaches. Now, as Nick's already mentioned, it's important to be uh, aware of the fact that really Implementing a good incident response capability involves two aspects. It's not just about the steps you take when you respond to a security incident. Obviously, that's a significant part of it. But much of the work to implement an effective incident response process can actually happen before a security incident occurs. So in this next part of the webinar, we'll just briefly discuss the various steps, both in the preparatory phase before a security incident occurs, uh, that you can actually do work now to actually implement. And then also, we'll get to the part where if you actually experience a security breach, what steps you can, what you can take. Now, in terms of the preparatory steps, there are a few. Firstly, identifying your external support contacts. It's very, very difficult uh, nowadays with the complexity of modern security, uh, sorry, modern cybersecurity breaches um, and the regulatory requirements involved and so forth. Typically, it's going to be very difficult for an organization to be able to handle a security breach in isolation from external support. So we'll discuss that in a moment. Allocating internal responsibilities so that there's a central point of coordination from which your business handles security incidents. Implementing technical measures, whether logging or monitoring and, and incident response and, and uh, intrusion prevention and detection, sorry. Uh, and also finally doing a dry run of the incident response process to actually make sure that it works in practice. And in practice, what, where all of that comes together is ultimately that, that's the content of the plan. So when you're developing an incident response plan, those are the things that it ultimately needs to contain. It needs to contain you know, what the roles and responsibilities are, um, who's going to be contacted, uh, who potentially may need to be involved, um, which we'll talk about on this slide, um, some of the technical controls that may be in place. And effectively, the plan captures all that material. Realistically, it's unlikely that someone's actually going to grab the document in the middle of an incident, mm -hmm. but having it there um, is that safety blanket of actually knowing that it's been thought through and planned. Yeah, and I think that's, that's the key point. Having actually thought, done the thinking and gone through that exercise initially is really, the, I guess, the key takeout from, from, I guess, this part of the webinar. Um, so the first step, as I mentioned, is really uh, identifying your external support contacts. And that's really even as simple as developing a list of who you're going to contact when you experience a security incident. Now, who you might contact, uh, depending on the nature of the incident, is likely to vary. So for example, if you experience a security incident where there's an element of 
fraud, for example, financial fraud, and there's a criminal aspect, um, such as from a phishing scam or a business email compromise scam, then obviously engaging law enforcement is going to be particularly relevant. It might not be as relevant in certain other types of scenarios, but if you do need to engage law enforcement, it's worth doing that early on in the process. Now, we suggested there on, on the slide that it's worth getting in touch particularly with the Australian Cybercrime Online Reporting Network, known as ACORN for short. And you can see the URL on the slide. Now, ACORN is a central point that the government set up uh, which facilitates if you report the details of a potential crime there, they can then forward the details of that to the relevant law enforcement authority for further investigation. Also very, very important, many of the businesses watching this may not necessarily have had much previous experience dealing with the security incident. And when you're actually in the middle of dealing with an incident, it's very, very helpful to have an experienced external partner, an incident response partner, to help guide you through the process, to help no, so you know what steps to actually take and so that you can actually have some external support to, to help you think clearly in that sort of situation. So engaging an external incident response partner, your preferred cybersecurity advisor, can be very, very worthwhile and it's something we would strongly recommend. We've also mentioned the option of speaking with ID Care. Now ID Care is a national not-for-profit service. They operate both across Australia and New Zealand. And they've been principally set up to actually assist uh, individuals who have experienced identity theft and loss of personal information from cyber attacks. But they do also offer packages for, for businesses when it comes to dealing with um, cyber attacks and also in some cases dealing with security incidents. So it's worth checking them out um, as, as, an, as an option as well. Thirdly, legal advisors. And particularly in the, in the context of the increasing amounts of uh, regulatory scrutiny that I mentioned and the introduction of the mandatory data breach notification laws, Having a relationship with a law firm of, of some sort that can help advise you of your legal obligations should you experience a security breach, whether a data breach or a security incident otherwise, is very, very worthwhile and that's something we'd strongly recommend. And there may be other stakeholders that you need to engage depending on the nature of the incident. So for example, there might be IT service providers such as your internet service provider when you're experiencing a denial of service attack who may be able to offer upstream support to help mitigate the effects of the attack. Also things like customers, regulatory authorities and so forth. Yeah, and just I guess two others that are on there as well. Um, a lot of organisations now will have um, a cyber insurance policy. Um, so cyber insurance uh, may require you to actually contact the insurer uh, at, a, at an early phase of an incident um, in order to, to effectively be able to make a claim. So usually they'll have a hotline number and sometimes making that call early on will actually give you access to some of these resources as well. Um, and the last part to keep in mind is often responding quickly is, is really, really important. Um, for example, in a case of financial fraud, if you've um, succumbed to a business email compromise scam uh, and transferred a significant amount of money to, a, a, to an incorrect bank account, um, the sooner you can contact the bank, uh, to try and reverse that transaction, um, the, the greater the chance that you'll be successful. So it, having this prepared so that you can respond quickly is really important. Mm. Yeah. Um, one of the key aspects when actually responding to an incident is, is having the roles and responsibilities defined um, up front. Uh, and the key part here is really knowing who has decision-making authority. Now, in a large incident response plan, and, and we've developed incident response plans for some of the largest organisations in Australia, you'll end up with roles that include you know, the incident owner, the incident manager, the technical response manager, the support response manager, the media manager, the PR manager, and, and the list goes on and on because of the organisation is so large and complex and they have that delineation of responsibilities. In a small to medium enterprise, the likelihood is that's going to collapse down, maybe to one role, possibly to two. The two key roles that we think need to be included are the ones here shown on the screen. The first is the incident owner. Now the incident owner really is the person with the ultimate responsibility for managing the incident through to completion. And there are a lot of decisions that may need to be made along the way. Um, for example, whether to engage law enforcement, whether to engage insurance agencies. Um, there may be a decision required in some cases about whether or not to pay, uh, pay a, um, a ransom. Um, now we're certainly not, we're not recommending that you do, but the point is that that decision ultimately needs to be made by someone in the organisation. And the other example that exists there as well around uh, the mandatory data breach disclosure that we've been discussing already is that there is a certain threshold at which a data breach becomes notifiable. 
Um, and we'll talk about that threshold later on. But at some point, someone in the organization has to make that determination. So there is actually a key role, if a data breach occurs, for someone to make a decision to say whether or not this decision, whether or not this, uh, this breach actually needs to be notified, both to the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner and to the people whose data has been lost. And so being ready for that, being prepared for that is really important. And the other role is, is the concept of an incident manager. So the incident manager is ultimately the person who is responding to the incident in practice. Um, now for a highly technical organization, that may, act, that may mean actually getting hands on, um, looking at log files, getting information and doing some of the investigation. More often than not though for small to medium enterprises, that's going to be the person that is actually involved in engaging the third parties, getting the right people involved, um, getting access to suppliers and third parties, particularly if a data breach involves one of your cloud services or another external system as well. And so those are the two key roles that it's really worth keeping in mind and, and establishing, if you can, um, ahead of a data breach occurring. Now one of the key things that really needs to be thought about prior to an incident occurring is how you will make sure that you actually have the information you need to be able to investigate that incident. Um, and one of the things that we find, so we, we have an incident response capability and we have a forensics capability. And often we'll get called into an organization to do an incident response project. And the first thing that we'll do is we'll start asking for log files, we'll start asking for audit trails and other information so that we can start trying to piece together what's happened. If that information is not available, it makes the response so much harder. And so really what we recommend and one of the key things is ensuring that ahead of time, you ensure that incident response um, preparation includes turning on logging, centralizing logging where you can, and putting in place technical mechanisms so that it's possible to reconstruct what's happened after the fact. Now there are a number of different technologies that can support this. Um, one is an intrusion detection and prevention system, um, and that can either be network based. A lot of common firewalls now will have some degree of intrusion detection capability. Um, it can also be host based. Um, some of the modern security software, it's called EDR software, Endpoint Detection and Response, also has a similar ability to capture information and allow for activities to be reconstructed after the fact. The other thing that's important is really ensuring that logging is turned on wherever it can be. Um, so a lot of cloud systems, for example, Office 365 and other cloud-based email platforms and, and um, application platforms, um, allow you to go into a security console and turn on logging. Um, simply doing that will ensure that that information about which user accessed which file or which user logged on at a particular point in time is available in the event that an incident occurs so that you can go through and do the investigation. So ensuring that those logs are established, um, having an understanding of where they're stored and what's logged is really, really important. Um, if you can end up with a, a single page that captures each of the key systems you have, what's logged from that and where those log files are stored, that can provide a really, really effective tool that you could provide to someone in the event of an incident to actually help with that incident response process. And lastly, one of the more advanced sort of levels you could look at is called a security incident and event monitoring system. So a SIEM is effectively the next step up from intrusion detection and logging and actually adds a layer of uh, analysis and intelligence over the top of that information being collected. The reality is that logging can have a couple of different purposes. Um, having those logs in place from a response capability really just means that when something bad happens, you can go back and look at them to see how that happened or what happened. Putting in place something like a SIEM actually allows you to have the ability to look at those logs in real time or have those logs analyzed in real time so that the bad activity can be detected and hopefully responded to and blocked faster. Um, and there are a number of SIEM as a service platforms that exist. Uh, SIEM Monster and Tesserant both have managed SIEM services and there are certainly others as well if you look online um, and Google for, for managed SIEM services in Australia. A lot of organizations are starting to provide these and they're really, really effective ways for small to medium enterprises to get access to a shared security service that can really help them. The last part that's really worth taking into consideration is it's, it's one thing to have a plan and it's another thing to test it. Um, now obviously the plan will get tested in a real life incident scenario um, and there's really no way that you can replicate that scenario um, it, with 100% accuracy. 
But at the same time, running through hypothetical scenarios, what's called a desktop exercise, is really, really important and really worthwhile. And really that's just a case of setting out um, some common scenarios, whether it's a ransomware infection, whether it is a data breach, and just having the key stakeholders in the room and talking through the process saying how would we investigate that particular infection, which systems would we look at, which logs would we need, and then verifying that all of that is actually in place so that if you tried to do that response in practice, that the material would actually be there and would be ready for you when you needed it. Now the second part of the incident response process is actually just being able to know what steps to actually follow should you experience a security incident. Now the precise order of these steps and, and so forth may um, I guess vary to some extent depending on the nature of the incident. But in this part of the webinar, we've tried to provide a bit of a framework for something you can follow uh, as a basic plan for how to respond to a security incident should you actually experience one. Now the first part of this is actually confirming for sure that an incident has taken place. And Nick, we had an interesting discussion about this uh, a week or two back, which I think is, is worth mentioning in this webinar. And that is that, I guess, knowing um, what's the best way is to confirm that an incident has taken place really is likely to depend on the nature of your business and specifically the type of cyber criminal that's most likely to target your business. So for example, if you're most likely to be targeted by a cyber criminal that um, is specifically interested in the activities your business is undertaking and is highly sophisticated in nature, then the steps you might take will vary from, uh, I guess, a business that's more likely to be in a situation where you're likely to be targeted by a run-of-the-mill cyber, uh, run cyber criminal who may not really be as interested in whether they hurt your business or another business, but they're just interested in, in being successful in a cyber attack of some sort. Yeah, yeah it, it, this is a really interesting discussion. Um, and it, in many ways, it, a, a good parallel is, um, if you've ever had that experience of you know, waking up in the morning and you feel lethargic and you've got a bit of a cough and a sore throat, and you Google you know, the lethargic cough and a sore throat and the internet tells you that you've probably got some life-threatening disease, um, whereas in actual fact you've just got a sore throat. The symptoms that we can give you for potentially having a security incident are really the same thing that often, the, often they may not mean something. You know, we can say that you, you know, symptoms would be your computer behaves strangely, you know, it crashes unexpectedly, um, it runs slowly, um, applications you know, behave in unexpected ways, files appear or disappear. And, and none of that is sort of normal behavior, but it could also just be, um, it could be that your computer is uh, a bit old, it's a bit slow, um, that someone else is using the computer legitimately, um, that you, you, know, you have some um, sort of bloatware that's running that's slowing down the system. There are a whole number of reasons why systems behave in, in unusual ways and it's not necessarily that the system has been compromised. So from that, the question then becomes, how do you confirm that a system is or is not compromised? And this is really a key part of the discussion. And the obvious answer is, there are some security suites out there. So for example, if you have security software installed and you run the security software, and it says that there are no infections, there are no known issues on the environment that you've just scanned. You have to make a decision about whether or not you trust that and that seems like a reliable response um, or you don't trust that because you think that the attack may be more sophisticated than the security software that you have in place. Now provided that the security software is, is modern, it's up to date, patches are installed and so on and so forth, then that really is a judgment call about who you expect is likely to be attacking you and what your threat profile is. So for the vast majority of small to medium enterprises, if all of your security systems are telling you that you're clean, then the chances are that's a reasonable expectation to take. It's probably giving you an accurate feedback. Um, if on the other hand you're a defense industry supplier, for example, um, and your systems are telling you that, you're, that they're clean, but you're noticing behavior that just doesn't feel right, um, then that may be a good point to engage external consultants to come in and have a look. Because in that kind of industry sector, there is a genuine possibility that you're being targeted by attackers who have capability beyond standard security software detection capabilities. Mm. And uh, it's a really interesting point. Uh, I, I found that discussion quite interesting. It's not simply just a case of looking at suspicious system behaviors in a vacuum. You really need to consider that in the context of the, I guess, the, the profile, the threat profile 
that your, your organization is operating in. So that's mm. really the key takeaway point from, from that slide. Now, the second, uh, the second aspect to an actual incident response process is actually understanding what the scope of a potential incident is and what that really means is really understanding the extent to which your IT environment has been compromised. Is there one system that's been compromised? Are there several systems and devices that have been compromised? What parts of your, your network have been compromised? And that's a really critical prere prerequisite so that you can then implement containment measures and you know what actually needs to be contained and isolated from the rest of your IT environment to prevent the breach getting worse. Now, this is why uh, Nick spoke earlier on about the, the importance of enabling logging functionality. This is where the use of those logs becomes particularly critical because logs provide, I guess, a point in time uh, status update for the way your IT or the, or the way your IT environment was operating up until the point a security breach occurred. So they really are helpful as part of the investigations process to understand what's been compromised, um, whether potentially sensitive data, uh, personal information that you hold might have been compromised, and also can help you to ascertain whether key systems might have had their functionality damaged or compromised in some way, so that you can then have an idea of whether those systems need to be taken offline, whether they need to be rebuilt or have backups restored and so forth. Now thirdly, and I won't, I won't spend long on this because it's really just carrying on from the point we mentioned in, in the first part of this uh, discussion around incident response, but it's really now the time to also look at engaging your external support contacts. Now as I mentioned, the external support contacts you engage with will really vary depending on the nature of the incident. But at the very least, make sure to engage with your incident response partner, uh, so whether that's your preferred cybersecurity firm or ID care or someone else, just make sure that you, you do that early on in the piece if at all possible. And also, as Nick also mentioned, uh, engaging with your cyber insurance, uh, if, you, if you do have a cyber insurance policy, engaging with your insurer early on is also important because they'll want to be aware of the details of a potential claim. And also, obviously, your legal advisors, should there you know, be potential uh, uh, regulatory obligations that might apply, for example, with the mandatory data breach notification laws. And there are also others that may apply depending on the nature of the incident, such as law enforcement, uh, customers and supply chain partners, regulatory bodies, and so forth. So in terms of confirming that an incident's hap happened and, and beginning the remediation process, this is largely that, that discussion that we had just before about you know, how do you tell that an incident's occurred? Um, now in some cases, it can be pretty straightforward. Um, the incident may be that uh, there's you know, ransomware is showing up on your screen and stopping you from getting into a system. Um, in other cases, it may, be, it may be more involved. Once you've figured out what the incident is, it's necessary then to contain the problem. And containing the problem can be as simple as um, isolating the affected system. For example, if you have had a system that's been infected by ransomware, the recommendation, generally speaking, is going to be to pull the network cable or to, or to disconnect the network stack. Um, now, there have been some edge cases where ransomware has been reported as being set up so that if the network connectivity is lost, it'll cause some problem. But the reality is that most of the time, that's going to be the best recommendation that can be made. But again, containing the problem really depends on the type of incident. If the incident's a denial of service attack, then the chances are you're going to need to get in touch with your internet service provider or telecommunications provider to try and get some upstream help um, to block that traffic. But the key really is diagnosing the problem so that you understand it, so that you can actually contain that breach, so that you contain that loss. If it is a data breach scenario, then in many cases there are two issues that you're dealing with there. If there's been a data breach, there is obviously both the loss of that data that you have to deal with as a business issue, but there's also some technical vulnerability that existed that allowed that data to be stolen in the first place. And so that technical vulnerability needs to be identified and needs to be dealt with as well. And so the containment process really involves understanding what has actually happened and that may not be just one case. There may actually be multiple different things that need to be addressed and contained. And then actually going through a mediation process. Um, for something like ransomware, sometimes there are uh, actually keys you can get. There are products you can get that will allow you to remove them. Um, in other cases, it may mean going back to backups and recovery uh, technologies that way. Um, and in other malware scenarios, again, you may be able to clean it using security software. In some situations, that may not be possible. So ultimately, if you need to engage external support to get advice on how to respond, it's really important to do that as early as you can. 
Um, but going through a remediation process is an important part to ensure that you've got a, a clean system to get back to business. Once you have done that, it's, it's important to conduct a post-incident review. And really this is to try and learn from the process. Uh, in the same way that I mentioned before, that when you, when you do a, dot, a dry run, when you run a desktop inc incident response exercise, um, it's never going to be exactly the same as responding to a real incident. And so when you do have a real incident, as unfortunate as that is, it's important that you do learn from that. If you identify that there were logs that would have been good to have that you didn't have, make sure that those are then put in place so that you do have them next time. If you identify that one of your suppliers um, is a weak point in your supply chain, the reality is you may need to actually look at either working with them to improve their security or potentially swapping providers, potentially swapping hosting providers, swapping technology platforms or something similar. Ultimately, the incident and the lessons you learn from the incident need to flow through both to the plan that you have in place and the way that the organization operates to make sure that the controls you have and the risk profile you have actually line up with the business itself. Now, the other part that's really important when we're talking again about, this one's particularly about a data breach, is how to communicate it with your customers. Um, and there's a really good uh, page on this on the Security Colony website. So if this is something that you're interested in, please go to the Security Colony website and you can download um, this page that talks about cybersecurity communications and incident response communications. Really there are about seven key things that we recommend here. Um, and this all relates to how you message to customers, how you communicate to customers um, how open you are, how honest you are, and ultimately this is going to impact on how, how the, the breach is perceived um, in the outside world. The first thing that we recommend is that you make sure you communicate accurately. Now, a lot of these may sound really obvious, but if you look at some of the breaches that have occurred previously and some of the disclosures that have happened, you see situations where this hasn't happened. And the reason this first one is tough is often in a security breach situation, you won't know with complete accuracy what's happened. But the important thing, for example, is if you're not sure whether or not passwords have been lost or you're not sure whether or not credit card data has been lost, don't go out and say that you're certain that it hasn't. So ultimately, ensuring that you're accurate is really an important thing. The second part, which ties in, is e effectively exercising restraint. Um, so there's certainly an understanding and an expectation that it will take you time to complete an investigation and know with complete confidence what's happened. So the important thing is making sure that you're only communicating the facts that you actually know at the correct points in time. The third part, which is around technical accuracy, is really geared towards the fact that the people that are particularly interested in data breaches at the moment are obviously anyone whose data that has been lost but also it's cybersecurity industry professionals. Um, and a lot of the commentary, a lot of the, the voices that will speak the loudest in response to a data breach are well-informed, technically, uh, technically versed voices. Um, and so if, for example, um, you go out and say that the passwords were encrypted rather than saying that the passwords were hashed, it's the sort of thing that is actually going to be picked up on and will demonstrate a lack of technical understanding in the response. So it's really important to ensure that communications about a breach are technically accurate. The fourth point is around clarity about who is affected by the breach. And this is really the case when only a subset of your customers are affected. Um, if you have 100,000 customers and you've lost 2,000 customer records, all 100,000 will assume that they are in that list until you tell them that they're not. And so having that clarity around who is infected and who's not is really important to make sure that you can achieve. The fifth part, which is around timeliness, is about making sure that you know when to go live with the message. And this one is arguably one of the hardest. Um, the recent Equifax breach um, that occurred, a lot of the criticism there was about the fact that there was a period of weeks, if not months, between the breach being detected and the notifications going out. But then at the same time, in order to meet requirements one and two and communicating things that you know for sure, it takes some time to go through that process of doing analysis and making sure that you understand what's happened. So there really is an internal tension here. But making sure that you do respond at the right time, which is to not sound uh, overly simplistic, but as early as possible, but as late as necessary, 
you really do need to find the right time. Sixth, communicating with empathy and respect is really important. Um, the reality is that you have, in this scenario, you've lost individual's data and they will take it personally and they will be concerned. So genuinely being empathetic about that concern um, and showing respect is really important and not downplaying the impact on it, of it on them. Uh, and lastly, being genuine. Um, often with genuineness, I mean, it, it really is just a case of, of taking it seriously, being honest, being open, um, and really not using weasel words, I think, in a lot of these messages. Um, for example, the number of data breach disclosures that start with, we take your security seriously, and then go on to say that it was a sophisticated attack, um, really those messages ring pretty hollow. Um, and so being genuine, being open, being accurate is really the key to ensuring that the message is going to be well received by the people whose data you've ultimately lost. So quite apart from the, uh, the, the communications aspect that Nick's spoken about, there's also now the regulatory overlay which applies in the context of the introduction of the mandatory data breach notification laws. Now, because there's uh, going to be significant interest from many of the businesses watching this, we thought we'd, we'd spend a few slides just quickly covering off um, this aspect of, of data breach notification. Now, the, the, the mandatory data breach notification laws will commence operation on the 22nd of February next year. And they won't necessarily apply to every business watching this. However, if you're a business uh, with, a, with an annual revenue turnover exceeding $3 million, or if, you if you're a subject to one of the exceptions in the Privacy Act, and, and please speak with your legal advisors for, for completely thorough legal advice on this, but uh, for example, if you hold health information other than in an employee record, or if you disclose or collect personal information for a benefit, service, or advantage, then the Australian privacy principles will apply, and that will also mean that the, uh, that the mandatory data breach notification laws will apply. So if the laws do apply, then it's also important to understand what's actually covered by the law. So it doesn't necessarily apply to any type of data breach. It specifically covers data breach where there's a loss of personal information. And the definition of personal information in the Privacy Act is very, very broad. So it concludes any information or an opinion about an identified individual or an individual who is reasonably identifiable. So even if the information itself uh, isn't, doesn't necessarily directly identify an individual, if it falls within the ambit of that definition, it can still be caught by the mandatory data breach notification law. So it's always worth engaging with your legal advisors should you experience a data breach and you're concerned that what you lost might constitute personal information. Now, in terms of what, uh, when a data breach needs to be reported in what circumstances, well, firstly, there are a couple of limbs to the mandatory data breach notification laws. So if you experience uh, unauthorised access to modification of or disclosure of personal information that's held by your business, then you could potentially need to, uh, to, need to report that data breach. In addition, if there's a loss of personal information and it's likely that there'll be that circumstances will arise that, that will mean there's unauthorized access to or disclosure of that personal information, then you might need to report the data breach. However, there's a key threshold that first needs to be met. And that is, and you can see that on that slide there, but the unauthorized modification access to or disclosure of the personal information needs to be likely to result in serious harm to affected individuals. Now, whether that harm is financial in nature, nature emotional, psych psychological, or otherwise, there needs to be that key threshold that's met before you report, uh, before you need to report the data breach. And I'll speak about that a little bit more in a moment. If you do uh, need to report a data breach, then it needs to be reported both to the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner and to affected individuals as soon as practicable after you become aware of the circumstances of what's known as an eligible data breach. And we've taken that information from the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner in terms of what actually needs to be included in the notification. So it includes business name and contact details, um, description of the breach, and also information about recommended steps that affected individuals should take in response to the breach. You know, for example, whether that's resetting passwords, resetting key accounts, uh, you know, getting in touch with their financial provider and so forth. And that's probably worth just saying that the, the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, they actually have some great resources mm. available on their, on their website to support this process. Mm. They've got a whole range of sort of draft guidelines about how to do these assessments, um, some plain English versions of the, of, of the Privacy Act, um, and also particularly around this notifiable data breach uh, legislation. So if it is an area that you, you think may affect you, um, you fit into one of the definitions and you do hold personal information, it's really worth checking that out and, and, and 
taking that into consideration. Yeah, and we, we also do have um, quite a few resources on the security colony as well yeah. around uh, <coughs> data breach notification in relation to the, to the laws and also actually um, in relation to ways you can communicate about a data breach going back mm -hmm. to, to what Nick mentioned earlier on or discussed earlier on. Now, the final point that I think is really important to mention, and it's, it ties it back to the incident response discussion we've been having, is this key threshold that you only really need to report a potentially eligible data breach if it's likely to result in serious harm to affected individuals. In other words, individuals to whom the information relates. And that's a really key threshold to appreciate in the context of incident response. Because if you are able to, uh, to implement an effective incident response process, using some of the steps we've talked about. So for example, being able to promptly detect and identify a potential breach, and then engage external support or implement appropriate uh, corrective measures to isolate the potential breach, then you might be able to demonstrate that there's, uh, there's not likely to be a risk of serious harm to affected individuals, and therefore you may not necessarily, from a regulatory standpoint at least, need to report the breach. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you might not choose to report the breach to your customers, for some of the reasons that Nick's discussed in the previous set of slides regarding just the, those seven points that were mentioned. But it's at least good to know that from a regulatory standpoint, you won't necessarily be obligated to do so. And I think that's, that largely captures the, the sort of crux of, of the incident response process. Um, and we talked a bit about the, the procedural side, some of the communications, some of the technical aspects to consider ahead of time. Um, and also, of course, the, the latest aspects around the notifiable data breach. In terms of external resources, there are a few we suggest. Um, the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, we just spoke about. Um, th there are links included there. ID Care, we've mentioned as we've gone through along with CERT Australia. Um, as I mentioned again, Security Colony, please do sign up. It is free and there are some really good resources there along with these slides and also along with the cheat sheet. Um, and there is a, a link there at the bottom um, which deals with some of the specific factors around communicating externally, which is a, a YouTube video that has some good material there. Um, so with that, we'll, uh, we're happy to take some questions. Um, so we'll throw over to uh, Jared, and um, you can let us know if anything's come in. Thanks, Nick and Aaron. Uh, we have a few questions that have come through. The first one, which you probably really have, have covered off in a lot of detail, but maybe just a simple answer, it comes from Philip. Uh, his question is really, what is the definition of a security incident and why is the accidental breach is different to a part of an actual security incident? Yeah, so in many ways, um, th there's no single clear definition of a security incident. Um, often a security incident will include everything from a, a breach of acceptable use policy. For, so for example, a staff member visiting an unauthorised website through to know, a wholesale compromise of an environment by a, by a hacker over the internet. So, you know, it's obviously a really, really broad sort of area. Um, the reason that it's worth distinguishing between different groups is largely just because the response process is going to be different. Um, so a security incident, a security incident response plan can actually be built to deal with all of those different um, scenarios. The important thing is basically categorizing them into different groups and saying, you know, if it's a, a case of you know, a staff member sending out an, an email incorrectly or a staff member not following a policy, how do you respond to that differently as opposed to um, a particular attack taking place and needing to respond to that differently? So it, it really can be as broad as possible. It really just feeds through into how you respond. Excellent. Thank you. A uh, question from Marcelo in regards to uh, the services of cloud providers. If a customer has an incident on their systems which mm -hmm. are in a cloud uh, provider, who is the response? Responsible, who is the responsible to report, analyze the breach? Is it the cloud provider or is it just part of the whole incident response plan? Yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a, a fascinating area to discuss. Um, the, the Privacy Act applies to, um, to the organization that effectively sort of holds the data or, or, or sorry, owns the data or owns the, the customer relationship. Um, so ultimately, if you as an organization have a lot of uh, records of customers, but they're stored in you know, AWS or Google or Azure or wherever else, if there happened to be a data breach in that environment, even though it really didn't have anything to do with you and your records or those customer records were compromised, it would be you as an organization that would have to have that disclosure to the customers because ultimately they are 
your customers and that's the personal data that you as an organization are looking after and you've then engaged a third party to have a role in, in doing, that, doing that activity. Um, and so certainly when you are building out an incident response plan, it's really important to understand where sensitive data is stored so that you can build them in. And some, in some cases, it's really worth having a, a discussion with those third parties about how that interaction occurs. Um, so you know, will they necessarily tell you if there is a security incident that occurs that might affect your data? And ensuring that that's actually built into contracts and agreements can also be an important step. So in, in I guess that's a, a long way of saying that um, ultimately it's, it's still your data and so you still own the obligation to protect that data and to do the notifications. Um, and part of the incident response planning should really involve engaging with any of the third parties that might have a role to make sure that all of the different roles and responsibilities are understood. Yeah, and, and just on that, so I mean, I guess th that's also that interesting point you mentioned. So Unix there specifically, I guess, discussed mainly around personal data and, and data breaches mm. and so forth. Um, more broadly, when it comes to security incidents generally, um, it's also important to, 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 I guess, when you're engaging a cloud service, many of the, the reputable and major cloud service providers now actually publish a delineation of responsibility. As mm -hmm. a, so indicating, for example, what they'll take responsibility for from a security perspective and what you, you're expected as the customer to take responsi responsibility for from a security perspective. Uh, and it's, so it's interesting to, to check those out. It's actually very, very handy to check those out so that when you're engaging a cloud service provider, you actually res understand your respective responsibilities. And I think that can help you a lot mm. during the incident response process as well. Fantastic, thank you. And the last question also from Marcelo in regards to data breaches. Uh, it's more a bit of a statement at the same time a question. Data breaches uh, are also for own employee records as well, aren't they? So not just external uh, customers or uh, clients, but uh, in internal records also, of, say, employees. Yeah, I think from memory in the Privacy Act, and um, I have to check this out again, there is a significant exception for employee records, mm. is that right? I think, uh, And I think it actually carves it out so that it isn't, as covered as extensively by the Privacy Act and the Australian Privacy Principles mm. um, as as the as other aspect as other types of personal information, and that's why um, we actually uh, made point of mentioning in terms of some examples of personal information that's covered. It could, for example, include health information other than in an employee record, because if it's in an employee record, I think it's actually one of those exceptions that falls outside the purview of of the scope of the mandatory data breach notification laws. Yeah, again, I mean it's. And, and even with that, there are, there are specific cases where employee records are included mm. in scope and included out of scope if it's you know, for the purpose of being an employee record or sometimes if it's not. Um, if an employee is also a customer, then it, it can be quite, uh, quite complex, which is really one of the, one of the reasons why we, we do say it is necessary to get legal advice around some of this. Um, and also, I guess, which is one of the, the challenges with the fact that this legislation hasn't really come in yet. It, it takes effect in February. Um, and we're really not sure yet how it's going to play out, how, how people are going to actually interpret this concept of a risk of serious harm. Um, so it may be that you know, the 22nd of February rolls around and there's radio silence and we don't actually hear many data breaches getting reported. Um, or it may be that the airwaves are, are flooded with, with notifications of, of people who think that um, you know, an email address is potentially could cause serious harm. Um, so I think it, it's really going to take um, a period of, of months after it's come in for the whole process to really settle down. There are a lot of draft um, guidelines available on the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner website that are worth looking at, but they are still draft. And so a lot of this is really going to be thrashed out over the next few months. Lovely. Um, Again, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, the next uh, webinar is on November the 24th, uh, and we'll be looking at cloud and external supplier security specifically. Um, again, please do join us on Security Colony. Ask us any questions that you have. Um, download the slides. Uh, you can watch this again at uh, industry.osgovtv.com if you thought it was so great and you loved it the first time. And uh, we hope to see you in a month. Thank you.